You know, Ken been in my life for 25 years, so uh, it's huge. We've been friends for a long time, so it was a great connection. Then we got talking, and it came back to me. His pastor prophesied over me about mm, 26, 27 years ago to go start a church east of where I was. And some of you may remember this, Dennis. I went to Liberty, Texas and started that Liberty Church up there where we met Don Nash and Ralph Haley and all these guys came in. Well, it was his pastor that, that prophesied over me to go. And so I looked back and I thought, I don't know if I should like this guy. <laughs> and that church is still rocking and going. My, my, my friend, uh, pastor friend of mine is a, uh, um, is a police officer that pastors it now so i'm excited that it's still going it seems like everything i've got started and it's still moving a little bit but i thank god for this man I, when i talked with him and gail i thought my he said like a kindred spirit you've heard me use this phrase before they made my baby jump you know like when elizabeth and mary got together and they both pregnant their babies jumped there was something exciting there was a connection there and i feel that at times when i get around certain people my baby jumps you know i go okay that's my brother that's my sister you know i feel good so we enter in and keep talking so we talked enough he had an opportunity and i thought you know man i'll tell you what if you'd ever fit in any church it's going to be the little country church Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm going to let him do, he's going to do a couple songs uh, matter of fact sister Lori listened to him she told me she said baby this man's good. And I went, yeah, right. You say that about a lot of dudes, baby. So, I mean that in the kindest way. Uh, but the, the thing with, with uh, uh, we've laughed. Man, we've la that's all we've done is laughed at each other like two drunk kids. By the way, you look good today. It's 8.59. I can see the clock in the back. You notice Pastor ain't wearing glasses today. Yeah, Pastor had an implant put in Monday, and uh, so I'm 2020, able to see, look good, no more. And by next Monday, I have the other one done, and I'll be, be done. Hallelujah! You don't know what it does to you when you can't read your Bible and you can't uh, see people you love in the back, and you have to walk around the church and those in the building. And that's what was happening to me, and, and it was progressively getting worse to the point in the next couple of years, I'd probably have lost my vision. So uh, it came on fast, and they, they found a cure, and they put an implant in, and I, I walked out, and the doc said, how you doing? I said, I, I, either I got born again or I'm on drugs, because, man, this is amazing right now. I mean, <laughs> everything got bright. I, I could sell eye surgery, I guess. You know, I mean, it's just that, that good for me. So I thank you for praying for me, those who have supported me. Some of you even financially helped me some, so I want to thank you for that. But I appreciate this man. I'm going to give him all the time I can. He's going to do two songs for you, then you just dismiss. The kids, just kick the kid out after he finishes the second song, all right? I want him to have to get back up to be reminded. We just turn him loose. Y'all welcome, Brother Johnny Rollett. Would you do that? Come on, give him a big welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Woo, look at this place. Come on. Man, it's good to be here in the little country church. I don't see anything little about this place, and I don't see anything little about your pastor. He's uh, He has turned out to be somebody that I honor a lot, and I've been tuning in, watching, connecting. I didn't even realize we were connected on Facebook for years now. I didn't even realize it until the other day I was going through. I was writing you a message. I'm like, I've written this cat before. And I just I just think so highly of him and the and his wife and what's going on here. How many of you know you should be grateful for what God has placed in your life? How many of you know you should never take it for granted? Come on. I mean, I wish that you could travel with me and you could see what a blessing this place is. When I walked in the doors, I told Pastor, I said, this place is like comfy, like home, man. It don't feel religious in here. It feels like Jesus in here. Come on. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my wife is in the back. She's the pretty one. Next, sitting next to Michael Cepeda and his wife, but she's ducking. Yeah, everybody just stared at her uncomfortably. She just loves that so much. We just pulled in from California uh, and yesterday got in town and, uh, and uh, really grateful to be here and, and uh, just so thankful to be connected. Father, I just thank you this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your covenant. I thank you for truth. And I thank you for loving us and allowing us to be in your presence. And Father, we just say with our mouths and believe in our hearts that you're worthy. 
You're worthy of us coming into this place with you this morning. You're worthy of our time getting up early and being in your house this morning. You're worthy of us tuning out everything else and tuning into what you want to teach us and show us and mold us and shape us. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Father, for being our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to do a song. I, I, I just thought about this. He said the kids are going to stay in the house. I, I want to introduce you a little bit to myself. I was born in Tulia, Texas. Does anybody know where Tulia is? <laughs> Nobody. That's great. This is great. It's up there by Amarillo. Ever heard of that town? Okay. All right, finally, we found you. Okay, but I moved when I was pretty young. When I was a pretty young man, I moved to have asthma, and we moved to uh, uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, or you might know it as Tombstone, Arizona. And I grew up in Tombstone since 1979. I graduated high school there, went to college there, all that kind of stuff. Was, and uh, just had a, a great childhood. And that the reason that's important, I'm going to bring that into my story here in just a minute. But how I got started doing this, it's just a weird thing that I get to do. And how I got started is I was, I was, I came out of the army. And when I came out, I, when I was in the army, I wanted to be a chaplain. And the whole reason I went to the army is because I didn't want to go and finish college. I couldn't deal with college. And uh, so I decided to go into the army. Well, in the army, I found my passion to be a, to be a chaplain, to, to love on people. And so I went to the chaplain and I asked him, what does it take to become a chaplain? He said, you got to go to college. <laughs> so it was like, man, I can't, I can't get out of this deal. So I came out of it and I became a pro rodeo PRCA chaplain. And we put on cowboy church for the professional traveling cowboy all over the United States. And uh, that's what I've been doing. And, and uh, I, I just kind of added music to the deal because I was just noticing I would Take, I was giving out Bibles to these pro rodeo bull riders and bronc riders, and I'd see them take their Bibles and rub it on their stock. <laughs> I'm like, man, it ain't a lucky charm. It ain't a rabbit's foot. You know what I mean? This is the word. And I started trying to teach them a little bit and trying. And I started thinking, man, how can I reach these guys and get the word in them? And I thought, I know what it is. They're listening to music, driving, you know, from rodeo to rodeo, and they're listening to music where they're losing their dog and their house and their wife and their biscuits and their grave, you know. I thought if I could put Jesus in a song, put the word in a song, and so I started to take every George Strait song, and I changed all the George Strait song, all the words over, and then I found out that's illegal. So <laughs> that, was, that was quite the wake-up call. So, so I started writing my own songs, and that's when Ken Holloway kind of got into my life, and he has been a huge blessing to me. And I'll never forget the first opportunity I got to kind of get out of the pro rodeo world and stop singing to cows and calves and in the dirt. And, and I got asked to go to this national corporate Christmas party. And they were going to fly me in and pay me more money than I had ever been paid. And I was so excited. And I'm like, I get treated like somebody, you know. And, and about a week before I was supposed to show up, they, the lady called and said, Johnny, we're so excited you're coming. But we'd really appreciate it if you didn't sing about Jesus. I'm like, <laughs> no, thank you. That was a good reaction. Y'all did a good job. Could I have a little bit more of mine? Y'all did a good job. I, my, my thing was, where did you find me? That's what I do is Christian country music, and that's all I do. And I said, number two, how many songs about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Knucklehead can you sing about before it just gets really boring? Because it's not about what it's about. That's not what it's about. So I took a song, and I, I got with a friend of mine, and we wrote this song <laughs> together. And I just want you to picture, there's about 3,000 people there. And this is the first song that I sang around the gate, and you wonder why they never asked me back. So, ha, <laughs> ah, come on. Somebody say, ha, ah, ha. Ah. That ain't bad. <laughs> Y'all did good. I like this. Come on. I'm at home here, man. Come on. Listen to this. Well, move over, Santa Claus. I've got to make a change or two. Yeah, for too long now you've played the part. They don't belong to you. <laughs> you spent some time in all their minds trying to take his place. 
All but Jesus Christ was here before the reindeer or the sleigh. <laughs> now, come on. Hey, so go ahead and have your fun and build your little snowman. But just remember while you're walking through your winter wonderland that the skies, the seas, the land, the trees, and even all that snow was made by baby Jesus and even Santa ought to know. Right? Come on. They look at me like this. You see? This is me right here. No, I, don't, I didn't do that. I think I just pulled a hip right out of place right there. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, I still like Christmas trees. And old Santa makes me smile. Oh, and Frosty brings a sparkle to every little eye. Yeah, but on Christmas Eve, I love to read the story once again of how God became a baby and took on the form of man. And now, right, come on. Hey, so go ahead and have your fun with Frost nipping at your nose. Just remember on this Christmas season, make sure everybody knows that while you're roasting chestnuts, hey, on an open flame, don't forget about the Christ child and the reason that he came. Come on, right? Oh, the skies, the seas, the land, the trees, and even old Rudolph's nose was made by baby Jesus and even Santa on the nose. Oh, yeah. Ha, ha. Come on. Oh, man. <laughs> it was funny because afterwards a lady, she kind of rolled up on me, and I was packing up all my rig, and and, uh, and she snuck up on me. She goes, hey, uh, just like this. Hey, I just want you to know that uh, I'm a Christian too. Yeah. I, said, I said, oh, so are you undercover? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you got to be bold about what you know. Come on. Everybody else is bold about what they think they know, right? My truth, your truth. There's only one truth. Come on. Oh, man. I'm going to do a song. I was, uh, pastor's wife asked me to do a different song, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be obedient to her and sing this song. And this is, a, this is a meaningful song to me. It was my first ever number one song. Uh, I didn't care about it. What's really crazy is I spent all those years trying to be somebody. Ken Holloway helping me trying to be something and be heard and be seen and be known and and it never worked nothing ever fell together for me and it just seemed like a, a ultimate struggle and then I kind of had a, a midlife collapse and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute but uh or as we called it a a relapse and uh and the Lord just at that time just restored my life and when he restored my life, he built a foundation that I didn't even realize wasn't even there. There was parts of that I had learned about my father that I didn't even know. I realized that I, everything I had ever learned, I learned for school and for grades. I never had it become intimacy with my father. And I was working on, my dad called me up and asked me to come to Oklahoma. He lives in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and he asked me to come and restore an old Mustang with him. And you got to understand, for me, that was a big deal to come and help my daddy restore this old Mustang, partly because when I was a kid, I didn't get to do nothing but hold the light. <laughs> this is the worst job, dads. Make, put a tool in their hand. Do something. Because this is terrible, especially when you have ADHD. <laughs> He's like, on the carburetor. I'm like, oh, okay. So <laughs> I just, so for me to get to go help him restore this 1969 Mustang. And if you get a chance, you see it on YouTube. It's amazing. But 
We spent a full month there, my wife and I. My wife broke every fingernail she got. She got in the middle of that car, and we, we helped finish that restoration process. And when it was pulling out of the garage, the light of day hit that car. And I just began to exclaim loudly, this is me. This is me, Dad. This is me. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, this was my life. I was broken, busted, rusted, disgusted. I was a mess. And he saw my value before I ever saw it. He saw there was something in me that needed to come out of me. He saw that it was worth the value of the elbow grease to get in and take out the old and put in the new. Come on. And my dad, my dad started, he, my dad's kind of reserved kind of guy, and I got way too excited. And, and I went home and I wrote this song. And when I didn't, I turned away from Nashville. I, turn, I don't care about Nashville. I don't care about none of those, that stuff. I'm, so, I'm grateful for them now. But when I stopped caring about Nashville, and all I did is turn my affection from being somebody to being his son, and my gaze turned back to my father, then what's amazing is as I did that, all of a sudden the songs came and all the acclaim came when I could care less. I'm just standing here today not because I've earned it, not because I come from Nashville or any of that nonsense. I'm here today because my father is a good, good father. Come on, man. <clears throat> so I wrote this song, and this was my first number one song. It's called The Old Mustang. Come on. <clears throat> if I could have a little bit of help here, that'd be good. Oh, that sounds good right there. Let's go. Through the dust and the grime and the <laughs> dirt and dime, you can see all the miles and years. Got it now. The paint is faded. It barely made it. Could bring a man to tears. Well, the dents and the dings and the rusty rings hide what she used to be. Well, she may be nothing but junk to you, but she sure looks good to me. Yeah, the tires are flat. Suspension's jacked from the rough roads in her past. Well, the motor's blown because the rods are thrown, but she used to be so fast. All the cracks in the pits and the windshield chips make it really hard to see. She may be nothing but a mess to you, but she means the world to me. This tired horse, it may be broken, come on, and you think her life is done. But me, I see so much more. One day I know she'll be restored. And partner, that old Mustang is going to run. Oh, and someday this Mustang is going to run. Listen here. This ain't what she was created for or what she was supposed to be. But with some love and restoration, she will finally be free. This tired horse may be broken, whoo, and you think her life is done. But me, I see so much more. One day I know I'll be restored, and partner, that old Mustang is gonna run. Oh, and someday this Mustang is gonna run. Hey, come on. Somewhere along the line of writing this song, I realize people are going to get it confused. They're going to think this song's about a car. It ain't about a car. It's about me, man. It's about what God did in my life. He didn't quit on me. He didn't give up on me. He finished the race. He walked me through. Come on. He, man, God is good. He's in the restoration business, right? So I wrote the last part of these words just to make sure there's no mistake. I'm withered and worn, tattered and torn from the miles and the years. My heart was jaded, my mind was fading, I shed a lot of tears. Well, the scars and the pain and the guilt and shame showed who I used to be. I may be nothing but a mess to you, but he still got plans for me. This tired horse, whoo! I may be broken, yeah, and you think my life is done, Woo, come on, but in me he sees 
so much more one day. I know I'll be restored. And partner, this old Mustang is going to run. Oh, and someday this Mustang is going to run. Woo! Come on. God is good. Oh, come on and watch me run. Yeah. Man, I don't know if you get it today. Your God is in the restoration business. Let's go. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. <gasps> Man, thank you, Jesus. Whew. Man. Lord bless them children. Even Santa. I don't know. Whew. Man. I'm sorry. I'm a little... I'm a little grateful. I'm a little tired this morning driving in. And sometimes when I get tired, I, I get emotional and leaned in to the Father. And I, I'm going to tell you, I'm just, I, as I'm sitting there standing in this place, I'm just thinking about how good he's been to me and how grateful I am this morning to be standing in front of y'all, how grateful I am for kingdom relationships, how good he is. I, when I was a kid growing up in southern Arizona, right on the Mexico border, it just has this, uh, <laughs> there's kind of a thing out there where there's not much to do, you know what I mean? And I always, as a kid, I had this mentality, this mental picture of what freedom really looked like. And it always, for me, I don't know what it was, but when I was a kid, I watched all them cowboy movies. Y'all like cowboy movies, you know what I mean? My favorite was the Cisco Kid. Y'all remember that? Hey, Pancho! That was my favorite TV show. Because he had all the silver down his pants. I'm like, I want silver down my pants. You know, I had all, I just had this mental picture of cowboy. I want to be a cowboy. And, I, and then I had, I saw every, it seemed like every movie, every TV show always had this picture of these wild horses. And for some reason, anytime they showed wild horses, they always showed them like overly romantic. Do you know what I mean? They're going like slow, <laughs> slow motion. And the horses are running. And usually they're on a beach for some reason. I don't know what that is all about. And then for some reason, it's always cold and like, the, the, the smoke's coming out of their nose, and the hair's just beautiful. And I'm like, oh, that's freedom. That's what freedom looks like. And so for me, I just wanted to be like a wild horse. I wanted to be wild. I wanted to do what I want to do and go where I want to do. And didn't, I don't want, I just leave me alone. Don't put no bit in my mouth. Don't cinch me up. Just let me run free. That's what freedom was to me. So I... <laughs> kind of grew up and and wanted to my all my dreams started coming true as far as cowboy and I thought I in Arizona and Texas and I'm like I'm a cowboy and I moved to Montana and I bought me a cowboy ranch and I was cowboying it I thought I was all that you think you're all that until you move to Montana those cats are the real, I think everybody there was like a horse whisperer. I'm not sure. Like they could just tell you looking at a horse what he's thinking. And I'm like, I just think he's hungry. So I just had this mental picture and I'm thinking, I, I've got this deal done. Now y'all know David, David Hinton, right? Dave Hilton. I keep saying Hinton. There's a friend of mine in Tulsa named Hilton. David Hinton. I just wanted to let y'all know, that's a real cowboy. Yes, sir. This guy, I found out is a wannabe cowboy. <laughs> and this is how I found out. I had these two neighbors. <clears throat> they're, they're cogity old neighbors. You ever, everybody in Montana is cogity. You know what I mean? Just kind of, are y'all cogity? Are you happy? You happy this morning? So these old cowboys, they came to my house one day and they said, hey, Johnny, you want to go rescue a couple wild horses from our place up here? I'm like, there's, at first I'm like, no, man, leave them alone. They got it made. They're free, Right? But then there's a little boy inside of me. He's like, we get to go catch wild horses. <laughs> so I'm like, let's go. So I get my rope. And I, everything I say from this point on, I want you to see, has a deeper, more valuable meaning. And you have to kind of catch it. Are you are you are y'all ready? All right. So watch this. <laughs> so I show up. 
and I'm just fired up. I'm a cowboy. I, some of this, I'm going to put my, this mic on a stand. Watch this. <laughs> well, maybe I will and maybe I won't. Okay. We'll just have to believe that that's going to stay there. I don't know how this is going to work. I don't think this fits in here, does it? <laughs> Josiah. I met Josiah today. I said, your name sounds really familiar. He said, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't like him already. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I need a place to put this so I can talk. There you go. I don't think it'll fit on that. Uh, just hold it. Yeah, just hold it. Hold it? Okay. Just hold it. Cool. So can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. The internet can't. Can the internet hear me? Okay, good. All right, so you're going to get hit. Just hold on one second. This is going to work. I promise you this is going to work. So I come in, right? I come in to the arena. This is me. Just a few minutes without the microphone. This is me coming in the arena. I was like, whoa, I'm a cowboy. I'm here to catch some wild horses. Come on. I'm a cowboy. I'm loud. I'm wild. I'm, I'm obnoxious. You ever made by like that? Come on, you see the connections, you're gonna get them. So I come in the arena. Let's put that there. Okay. And I see this mayor. I see this mayor standing there up against the fence. And I'm like, that's my girl right there. And I'm gonna I'm gonna run up on her. I'm just gonna catch her. No big deal. Catch her. And I walked in, and this is me just loud and abrasive. She started running because what? Because I'm loud and abrasive. Right. Come on. Right. And I'm coming on down. I see her. I'm like, whoo, there she is. Boom. And I get her. I'm like, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> and I'm walking back, and all the old cowboys, all the old Kajiti guys are standing on the gate. And I'm walking my wild horse back to my trailer. About this time, that horse said, I'm a wild horse. <laughs> and that horse picked me up and flipped me up in the air, probably 15 feet in the air. Uh, or it was a thousand. I'm not totally sure. And when I hit the ground, she started trying to plow me in the ground, started trying to knock the air out and beat me and bite me and drag me. And then she started dragging me. Uh, I'm just rolling around. There's so much dirt in the air, you couldn't even see me. All the old men on the fence were watching, like, watch this hand right here. And they lost track of me. And I'm like rolling and trying to move out of her way. And I thought she was going to kill me. And all of a sudden, she started dragging me. And she's pulling a rope through my hand. I've got gloves on my hand. And the, the rope is burning through my gloves. And I'm holding on. And she's dragging me. She dragged me all over the whole arena. She dragged me to Utah. <laughs> pretty sure. <laughs> and I'm letting, the rope is burning through my hands. And the guys are all, let go. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I've come too far now, right? And I'm barely hanging on to this rope. And I got to the very end of the rope. You ever been to the end of your rope? Yeah. And I'm just barely hanging on. I couldn't breathe. All of a sudden, in the middle of this dust storm, I lost my breath. And I'm laying in the ground. <gasps> And this horse is just not giving up. And I thought at one point, I'm like, I got to let go. I'm going to die out here. And about that time, the horse stopped pulling. And I was trying to figure out what to do. I couldn't even, I didn't have the strength to get up. I had dirt where dirt should not be. <laughs> and I started to, just trying to figure out what's going on. And all of a sudden, I heard that horse go, <gasps> <laughs> I realized I had wore that horse plumb out. So we became into an orchestra of breathing hard. The horse going, <gasps> and I'm going, <gasps> and, it got, <gasps> and it was just, a, it was hilarious. And all of a sudden the dust is settling and I'm screaming, somebody help me. And those guys are just on the fence just laughing at me, having a good time at my expense. So I stand up. And I find that start, and I'm walking towards this old horse, this mare, and she's breathing hard, and she's her lip is hanging, and I'm walking up to her, and I had one of them buckaroo ropes, you know what I mean? Like, it was like a 30, 40 foot rope, and I was so far away from her, I didn't, I'm like, I don't even know if I can get over there. And I start walking, and I'm, I'm just kind of gathering my coils. And as I gather my coils, I'm walking a little bit closer to her, 
And she ain't moving because she's wore out and breathing hard. But I'm thinking, she's going to kill me. That's what's going to happen right here. And I'm walking. I get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And all of a sudden, I got close enough where I started seeing who she really is. See, from a distance, from a distance, she looked like she was free. From a distance, she looked like she had it made. From a distance, she looked like everything was just fine. But as I got close enough to her life, come on. As I got close enough to her life, I started realizing all is not as it seems. And I realized when I got about right here that she needed me. Come on. She needed me to be in that arena. Yeah. She needed me to capture her heart and her life. Yeah. Oof, come on. Yeah. As I got up close, I started to see the first thing I noticed was that she was skin and bones. You could see her ribs. You could see her withers. She was just had no nourishment at all. Then I, as I got a little closer, I noticed that her, her whole body, her skin was literally crawling with worms and maggots and infestations because nobody was there to worm her and to take care of her and to love her. Then the next thing I saw is that, <clears throat> and this really got me, and this speaks to somebody here today. I, I noticed that she had hoof marks and bite marks, all scars all throughout her body from her own kind. People that are supposed to be in her family, yeah, right, people right. that are supposed to love her and know her and take care of her and cover each other are out here just biting and kicking her. And then, next thing I saw was on her hide quarters over here, I saw that she had, like, been attacked by a mountain lion or something, and it was like you just could see the claw marks down her hind quarters. And because no one was there to salve her and heal her, put, come on. Yeah, it was so gross, and the smell was horrible, and it was just green and pus. Then as I started walking up to her, I'm just calmly talking to her, and I'm realizing my heart is getting broken as I'm walking around her because all these years, everything I thought that I knew about her life, have being free, was completely ignorant. And I got up close to her head, and I saw that she had... A horse had kicked her in the teeth and caved in the side of her mouth and food was just coming out. And that's why she was skin and bone. She couldn't even chew on the nutrients. I looked down at her feet and they had completely grown out. This one right here was curled up like, like slipper looking deals. It was the craziest, weirdest thing. And this one... Must have been the same way, but had broken off and broken off into her quick that she could barely even walk. She was a complete mess. And she needed me. Yeah. So I gathered my coals and I I started to kind of kind of fight her, trying to jerk my lead. I was pulling on her, and she, as much as she needed me, she didn't realize it. Come on, man. Sometimes you're going to get around people that don't know how bad off they are right. and how much they need love. Come on. Come on. Amen. She's fighting and kicking and biting. and, and so It took me a solid hour to get her into my beautiful aluminum trailer. <laughs> I got her in this trailer, and I'm laying there on the side of the trailer with my forehead on the trailer. I finally, after all this time, I got her in there, and I'm laying her, and I'm still trying to catch my breath on the side, and I'm like, ah. and this old man, El Cogity Cuddly, he comes rolling up, and he said, hey, you going to go get your second one? <laughs> if I'd have had a voice, if I'd have had a breath in my body, I would have been yelling, no! <laughs> Did you not see what just happened? I almost died. I'm ready to pack it up. I'm ready to head back to the farm. Let's go. I'm done. I don't want to ever do that again. 
And as I'm sitting there with my head up against the cold trailer trying to think in my mind how I can get out of this deal, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and say, Johnny, if not you, then who? You got to get over it. Yeah, I know. I know you've been kicked. I know you've been bucked. I know you've been bit. And I know you've been dragged around. Get over it. Amen. And get your butt back in that arena. Amen. Pick up the tools that I've given you to accomplish the job. And go back into the arena that I've called you appointed and anointed you to do stop whining and complaining about how hard it is and how much they turned on me and how much they hurt me and how much they bit me and chased me and said no to me a thousand times get back in the arena started thinking about this later on and i realized that i don't know if you know the history of the american wild horse it's actually kind of interesting did you know that there was never such thing as not supposed to be something called the American wild horse. As a matter of fact, they're not really wild, they're feral. Right. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. Here's the history. Some of the history. There may be other history. This is what I learned. Is that number one, the American wild horse only lives between seven and ten years. You know why? Because they weren't called to be wild by God. Come on. They were called to be in my barn. Golly. They were called to be loved on. They were called to be bonded with me. Right. They were called to be under my heart. Good. The conquistadors brought them here, brought them to southern Arizona was the first place they say they brought them horses here. Watch this. They were war horses. They were champion horses. They were Beautiful, amazing horses, and they left them here by themselves. Come on, you got to get this. Yeah. They left them unto themselves. Yeah. And because they left them unto themselves, generation after generation, they became less and less who they thought they were, who they were called to be, and they became more and more wild. Right. Yeah. Come on. Come on. That's not who God called them to be, but because they got left by themselves, they turned and they became deceived and they became self-reliant. It's good. I know I'm yelling this morning, but my heart is just turned on to this thought. This is not who they were called to be. This is not what God had for their, their lives. This wasn't the uh, original blueprint for their lives. This is what happens when you're left alone. When you don't have somebody to love you and teach you and train you and mold you and shape you. When you don't have a relationship with the God who created you. Good. I started thinking about Romans 1. I'm going to finish the story. But I just want you to see something in Romans chapter 1. I've got another Bible. I don't think, I don't know. Gil, did I bring that mirror Bible? Yeah, of course not. <laughs> I had a whole other message planned, and I called Pastor last night, and I said, would it upset your wife if I completely changed my message? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen to this. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because all they, although they knew God, Come on. Knew about him. They did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful. But they became futile. Say futile. Yeah. They became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. If you really read between the lines there, they became less and less like their original blueprint and more and more like the creepy crawlies on the earth. Come on. Therefore, verse 24, therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness 
in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God's of God for the lie, exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the create the the create creation creature that does not what is it? It's like two words, creator. And let, let me say this the right way since I cannot see all these. I'm gonna need that same operation. They turned and they started worshiping the creature yes. rather than the creator. Thank you, Come on. Does that sound, man, that sounds so familiar what's going on. Hmm. Who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged natural use what is against nature? Likewise, also men leaving natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all the unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, and inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents, undiscerning, and untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. <clears throat> For knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only to the same, but to the approve of those who practice them. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, preach it, brother. Get them. Go get it. Go get on them. They're all they deserve, all those. If you think that this message, come on, man. Lord, please help me say this right. Yeah. If you think that this message aligns with your hatred, then you missed the whole point of this message. This message is, uh, let me just help you to understand something. And I'm going to say this as boldly as I can. I may never get asked back. But I want you to hear. I know his heart. How do you expect, when I walked into that round pen of a wild horse that was removed from its original blueprint of God, how ridiculous would it be of me to be surprised at how they were living and acting. How crazy would it be of me to be somehow offended at their actions? They're wild. It's they're wild. They don't know God. They don't know who he is. They have no understanding of their original blueprint. They're wild. And what's our job? How would they know unless somebody loves them enough to go into there and love them and teach them and mold them and give them Jesus? Come on. How do you judge a wild horse by anything other than wild until you what? Capture their mind, capture their heart, capture their life, and bring them to your house. So, I started to, I'm sitting on that trailer. You ever, you ever made a deal with God with gritted teeth? I went like this. Okay, God. <laughs> you ever, nobody, just me, you, me and you, me and you. <laughs> I picked up my tool, my pink rope. I don't know why I have a pink rope. <laughs> it's supposed to be red because it represents something, the blood of Jesus, a covenant that gives me authority to walk into any round pen. Come on. I picked up my tools. I picked up my heart, and I said, okay, God, I'll do it, but I'm going to go back in there, but this time, I want the oldest, <laughs> <laughs> broke downest, I want a horse on death's door, please, I cannot do this anymore, I don't have enough strength, let me come back next year, Sh shake it off, man, shake off the dirt. Shake off the wounds, shake off the pain, and get yourself back in the round pen. Good. So I started, I got, let me show you this. I got it, this is the powerful. 
got my I got my robe, and I'm still, and I'm almost crying, but I don't want anybody to see me. I'm like, God, what? This is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I'll never do it again. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm walking in, and this time, watch this. Somebody needs to hear this. All of a sudden, I wasn't this wild, crazy, woo, guy. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. What I noticed is that my approach changed. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying to be scared or anything, but this honestly, what I did, I went like this. You would too if you got what happened to you. <laughs> and I'm walking in and I see this old man horse laying on the gate. He looked like he was just the gate was holding him up and that's it. And I'm like, there's my guy. <laughs> and I started walking up to him and I get a little closer and all of a sudden he turned an ear to me. And I thought, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, please. And I raised my rope up. And as about that time, the horse turned his head to me. And as God is my witness, as I'm standing here right now, I don't know what happened. I cannot explain to you, but God was trying to teach me something. As I raised my rope, that horse turned its head to me, and he just lowered his head. And I began with dirt, filled eyes, just began to weep. And I walked up. And I laid my rope across his neck, softly and gently. And I began to touch him. And I began to tell him, you have no idea, but you just made the greatest decision of your life. Because I'm going to take you home. And I'm going to love on you. <laughs> I'm going to shod your feet. I'm going to worm you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to love you like you've never even ever experienced. You have no idea the plans that I have for you. Come on. Right. Come on. And as I pulled that rope a little bit, I did something a little bit interesting. Instead of jerking the rope, trying to pull him in, I dropped a coil and I showed him my lead. Come on. And I said, come on. And that old man walked right up into my trailer. Come on. I want to say to you this morning, I just want you to think about this as I close. What's the difference between that young man and that old man? What's the difference? Neither one of them knew what I was there for. There were guys there that, that day that were there to, for kill horses. They were taking these horses to go make dog food out of them. They didn't know what I was there for. That young mare just didn't realize how bad off she was and how much she really needed me. Sometimes you're going to run across people that just have no idea how much they need Jesus. Because they've been wounded, they've been kicked, they've been bit. Come on. Church sometimes can be the most damaging. But that old man... Here's what I believe in his heart that he was saying to me. He was saying, you know what, Johnny? I don't know what you're here for, but whatever it is has got to be better than the life that I'm living. Come on. In essence, what they're saying is that between the two horses is that you never know when someone's ready to bow their head and come home. You never know. When somebody's ready to stop fighting. And how would you know? Unless you pick up your tools with the right heart yeah. at the right time right. and keep showing up. Keep going back in. No matter your wounds, no matter how hard it is and tough it is, to keep getting up. This message is really, I know, for the church to stir up the body to remember what we're here for. To remember our calling and our purpose. To remember that if not you, then who? Who shows up? 
And if you'll just keep on showing up with the right tools at the right heart at the right time, you never know when that moment will be where someone will turn their head, turn their ear to you and bow their head. And you get to be in there to show the way and bring them to Jesus, the master. There's another group that might be here that you know what, Johnny? I don't even know why I came to church today because I've just been so kicked and wounded and hurt and I just have been running wild. And I just feel like you're talking about me and today is my day to lower my head. Today is my day to submit to my Father. The God that created me, I'm ready to come into the round here. I'm ready to come into his presence and to his a relationship with him. I realize he's my creator and I realize that I've been running from him and I've been being wild. And I realize that I lost focus of what his original blueprint was for my life. Just kind of boldly, kind of cowboy way. I just want you, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you where you are. There's a hand. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? Then the rest of us can pray for those two that raise their hands and we can pray and to remember, come on, to remember the ones who are out running wild, to invite them to church, invite them to your pastor, <clears throat> to don't give up on them, don't pack it in, don't go home. It's not time, it's not time for you to try to get out of here. You've got a calling appointed and anointed by God. And until you have your last breath, you've got to pick up your rope and you've got to pick up your heart and you've got to walk back into some round pins. Come on. Because that's who God created you to be. Let's pray for the two that raise their hands. Father, in the name above every other name, I thank you for my brothers. And I thank you that you never quit on them and never gave up on them and that somehow they came into this arena this morning. And Father, it was by no light design that you brought them here today. It's by your design that you loved them enough to bring them to hear a message that gets them back to submission to you, Father. To realize that what I thought was freedom, running and doing my own thing, really has led me to a life that I'm not happy with, I'm not proud of. And this morning, I lay my head down. I submit my heart to you. And I'm ready to come home. If everybody could say these words with me. I believe that words do not save you. But I believe a heart that is contrite and brought back to the Father, that is, that if you mean it, right where you are, he'll find you right there. He brought you here today for just such a time as this. Everybody repeat these words. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're God. And I believe that I'm not. And I need you. I need you to be my Lord. I need you to be my Savior. I submit my heart to you. I submit my life to you. I bow my head. I say with my heart and, I with, I, and believe in my heart and say with my mouth that you are my Savior. You're my King. You're the Lord of my life. I'm yours. I'm home. I say with my mouth and I believe in my heart that today I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. In Jesus' name, I'm home. I'm yours, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless y'all.